there's there's times that like people will pick on me for like using my like first of all my radio voice and my natural voice pretty much coincide with one another which i'm thankful for because i'm not like overly enunciating and crazy but there are times that i will like if i get full of energy it comes out very strongly and so like people still to this day will make fun of my um my my voicemail greetings because my voicemail greetings always sound like i like drank seven mountain dews before i did it like this is the one that i have right now oh my gosh hi there you've reached ryan spencer of alpha media live 96 7 mix 95.1 and ryan spencer energy so people will call like they'll leave the message and some people will pause for a moment because they're like what did I just listen to? Or they'll, they'll they'll respond back in the same tone. So I have I've had like guys from like the the people I buy like speakers from for DJing that'll be like, well, hi there, Ryan Smetzer. I'm so and so, and I'd like to buy or you know I'd like to talk to you about your sound equipment. And I'm like, ah, but like again, that has that has actually opened up for like gigs though before. Like we had a, a client of ours at the radio stations that they're a, a credit union in the area and. Like the owner called me one time and was like, hey, so I heard your voicemail greeting uh, the other day when I was trying to call you about like a like a thing for the radio station. And when I heard it, I was like, oh, my God, we need you to voice our 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 voicemail, like our answering, like our hold system. So now, like I've had like companies in the area that have reached out and they're like, hey, like if we pay you like such and such amount of money a month and we send you a script and you like, you know, format the audio to be the way that the phone system recognizes, can you just email us like, you know, and basically I just take the hold music and every 30 seconds it's like, you know, hey, if you'd like to get a credit card, call or hit the button, whatever, number four now. Thanks. And so it's opened up to opportunities. So I am you know, so fascinated by this because I haven't heard so somebody talk about this before even though i know it's a thing it's like don't don't be afraid to be the one that like four people might make fun of and pick on but one person may want to pay you for it i was like eight or nine years old i uh, i started watching a lot of tv with my parents whether it was like getting up in the morning and getting ready to get on the bus or getting ready for bed and so in the mornings i watched the today show when i was having my bowl of cereal and getting ready to go up to the bus stop and then at nighttime i'd watch american idol and so the two people that i was like i want to be these dudes were <laughs> ryan seacrest and matt lauer Obviously, the latter is no longer a dream role of mine, um, but I told my parents, I was like, I want to be the next Matt Lauer or the next Ryan Seacrest. One has gone off the wayside, obviously, um, but I, I knew I wanted to do... I wanted to do TV or something on camera that was hosting. And then as I started to like, as an eight year old do research, which I didn't have internet at the time, I just had a TV and, and radio boom box in my, in my uh, bedroom. You know, I just started like doing research. Okay. What does this guy do? What else does he do besides host American Idol? And that's when I caught the fact that he did like American top 40. And you know, in our area, we kind of vividly like just ever so slightly get hot 99, five in DC. So I'd listen to that all the time. And I would hear like, the Kane show and Seacrest and like all of that. I was like, okay, I guess that in order to get to like idol, I need to do radio. And then I'd start to learn more about radio and TV. And I'm like, all right, all of this is really cool. And I just like tried to find ways to do it even at that age. So like I would take my mom's old tape recorder from like her like, you know, attic closet area and literally dub over like Ryan Seacrest's voice with mine talking up American Top 40. Um, I wish I still had those tapes because that would be fun to be like my first air check. Um, yeah, right, seriously. <laughs> from, from God knows how long ago. Um, and. I, I went as far as to like at recess, I would get like a couple of friends of mine or people that probably just felt bad for me and went over to the jungle gym and hosted my own version of American Idol where I had like friends of mine that could sing and they would sing against each other. And I'd be like, all right. And after the recess wide vote, America has spoken and you're our wit like we'd and it was like every day at recess, I would do like weird hosting stuff I, for me. Like that was the that was my thing. I was like, OK, I need to like fill up my like brain with like this is how like this is done and so I would watch those shows all the time and then like in middle school that was whenever like I finally got the opportunity to do like morning announcements crew which was you know 
in in elementary school, it was just you had the phone over the intercom and you were telling everybody that it was pizza day. And in, in middle school, they were like, we have a TV station. And I thought it was the coolest thing in the world, even though literally all it was was, you know, all, all the schools had like the closed circuit TV where like, you know, whatever went into the one VCR broadcast over all of the TVs in the school. And so when it was like movie day or whatever, they'd pop that sucker in. Well, we found out a way to like, just hook the old camcorder into the back of the VCR and have morning announcements at like nine o'clock every morning. We would go live and there'd be somebody in behind the podium talking about what was going on during the day. And I was like, oh no, I want to spruce this stuff up. <laughs> so like we had music at the beginning. So we'd do like a, whatever song was at the top of the charts that was appropriate for middle schoolers. And we'd play that at the beginning uh, instead of graphics in lower thirds, because it was just a camcorder. We printed out like word art from Microsoft Word. That's that would amazing. be like, it's an A day. Field day is today. There's a field trip. Like I, I went as far as like when we had like, um, you know, football, like the Super Bowl or March Madness or stuff like that. I'd go into Google Images and find like pictures of like Eli Manning winning the Super Bowl. I'd be like, look, the Giants won the Super Bowl to open up the morning announcements. It just was like printed out on pieces of paper. So the whole thing's like flopping around and you can hear it like wiggling as like, and then you would literally pull it up and it would reveal the person that was behind the podium totally out of focus because you were just <laughs> showing a piece of paper the whole time. And, um, and yeah, and that was kind of, and, and we would do different segments. So like, when you'd be like, all right, now, uh, SGA would like to talk. We'd fly the SGA piece of paper on the screen and pull it up. And so, and I still have somewhere in my house, the badge my, that says Ryan morning announcements crew. Cause we all got pins that we made in like tech education or whatever. Um, cause we had to do like technology education, home ec and like all that stuff in middle school. So we made pins for all of the members of morning announcements crew. And that was when I was like, all right, this may be the dorkiest thing in the world. And I probably stand no chance of getting a girlfriend in middle school, but I am going to be the, like the today show guy of our middle school. So then we had like, you know, sporting events where like the, the principal would come to me and be like, Hey, we're having, you know, our own like basketball tournament between like our school and the school down the road. Uh, and we need you to announce the game and record it and film it. And there's a creepy picture on my like Instagram from a couple months ago that I finally put it up as like a throwback back of me in this like dorky looking yellow polo just hunched over on a camera like taking video and there's just like the girls basketball teams in the background so I look like the creepiest dude in the world like hey <laughs> um, but I would announce like softball games like BMX races that we would have like in the area and stuff like that all through like the early stages of middle and high school um, and then kind of took a step back from the broadcast stuff during high school because I went to school for musical theater uh, we had a, like a school for the arts that had just just opened up um, at the same time that I was leaving middle school. And it was literally all of the public high schools in the county had the opportunity to go to this school for the arts. And we were the first like four year class. We were the first like group that went through all four years of its like growing stages. And it was a lot of fun because we would do like, you know, musicals. We went and sang at Carnegie Hall in New York and did like a week long trip to New York. So I got to see the Today Show studio, which I was like wow. the only person geeking out about that at all. Um, um, and, and that was like, there was a 40 year stint where I honestly was kind of having this, like at 16 years old moment of realizing, Ooh, what do I want to do with my life? Because I had the option at that point, like, okay, I could do, um, you know, musical theater out of, you know, going into college, or I could continue what I've wanted to do since I was eight and do broadcast, do TV, do radio, do whatever that means, you know, coming out of college. And it was tough, but for me, it came down to like affordability and the fact that like my heart was in both places, but it was mostly in like creating content and doing radio and TV and being the next Ryan Seacrest was just the thing that hovered over me like the entire time going out of uh, out of high school. College was a whole different thing, too, because I didn't really know besides like being in my community college. I knew a bunch of people just because it was like, you know, 10 minutes from my high school. But like going to Shippensburg for my last two years for like electronic media a majority of my classmates were 
like people that traveled from like Philadelphia because it was a cheaper accredited broadcast program. So I really didn't know any of those people at all. And, uh, and that was a lot of fun. Cause again, it was just like that experience of like being the new kid on campus and, and, you know, getting to know, you know, people from that area. And now I'm able to then like follow their careers too, whether most of them went into TV. Um, but like a lot of them are scattered all over the place to where like, even when I'm traveling, I'm like, Oh, Hey, they're doing like the, night side show or like what you know that kind of thing like anytime I go to Ocean City Maryland for vacation um like there's like two of my classmates that are on a couple of the stations out there and so like I'll drive by and I'll see them reporting and I'm like hey they're probably talking about like a, a murder or something I'm just like hey good to see you um but you know it is what it is um but yeah that, the popularity very much staggered over time um but the passion for broadcast and like wanting to do something that was content based and like entertain people like stayed. And that's where yeah. like the DJing business started in my sophomore year of high school to where I was like, all right, I don't want to work a part time job at like a like a fast food restaurant or retail or any of that kind of stuff really couldn't because of rehearsals for shows and the schedule that was really involved with my school. And at the time, my mom was uh, the, the business that she was working for had a Christmas party that was DJed by this guy that is like local weatherman in our area that had been doing DJing for like 40 plus years. A week before the party, he decided to retire from DJing. So my mom was like, hey, if we buy you the equipment, you can pay it back over time. Do you want to start doing this whole DJing thing? And I was like, let's give it a whirl and see how it works. And I fell in love with that, which was like its own version of, you know, you know, entertainment yeah. in that time. So I was doing sweet 16s and homecomings and school dances and all that kind of stuff over time. I was doing that all through uh, sophomore and junior year and senior year of high school. And then I didn't start doing weddings until would have been summer of 2013. So whenever I graduated high school, literally the day after I graduated high school was my first wedding that I had ever done. And it was because I didn't want to have that like aura over me of like, who's that 16 year old DJing their wedding. Um, I knew like at that point, like, I felt like I could tangibly do it. Like I could put everything together. I could do the music. I could do the announcements. I could, I could do it. I just didn't think I could do it well enough and polished enough to like, to not look like a 16 year old DJing a wedding. So waited until I graduated. And then it just kind of grew into this thing where, you know, I, I'd worked like two or three months in retail and at a movie theater the summer after I graduated. And then by the time I got to the fall of the, the like year after I graduated high school, I was like, I can't work retail and do like, like movie theater work anymore. I have this business all of a sudden. So it grew to where it was like, Oh, this is my gig while I'm in college. And then it still has become a thing where, you know, whenever I'm, you know, working during the week. I'm still also like, you know, putting in that time of, you know, you know, talking to, to brides and, and communicating with clients and all that stuff. So, you know, it, it is it's a side hustle, but it's still its own full time job in itself because I try not to treat it as just a side thing. Like, all right, I'm going to click into, you know, DJ mode and, you know, that kind of thing, because there are a lot just like in in media, there are a lot of relationship building things that are super important with the wedding industry. And there are so many like I could I, at this point like I've, I've thought about writing a book on the way that like the wedding industry and the media industry like should intertwine with one another there's a lot of things that one industry can learn from the other um that you know as it continues to like grow and innovate and I uh, whenever I was at HCC, I, I did like announcing for basketball and volleyball at the college and would do some of those different things. But radio was always something that I was like, you know, I want to kind of get into this. And there's so many stations in our area, you know, let me just make a quick demo. And so I went online and literally Googled how to make a radio demo and found some weird prompt from somewhere, recorded it added in music and and made like, you know, a makeshift air check. And I sent it to literally every radio station within an hour from Hagerstown and didn't hear back from a single one. Um, and I was like, all right, well, that was fun. Uh, okay, whatever. Um, I try, try my best. And then um, at one point in the spring of 2015, whenever I was like just a couple months from graduating HCC and planning to transfer to Shippensburg, um, Mix 95.1, our sister station for live um, for, you know, Alpha Media, they had just gotten bought by Alpha Media. They were mainline broadcasting at the time. And, and when Alpha came in, they were like, 
you know, we're live and local, live and local. We want to have like all of our stations be live and local. So we want to have a personality on on the weekends. And so they put out a commercial that was like, hey, uh, you know, we want to get a personality on on Saturdays. If you're interested, it's part time. Uh, send us an email with your demo. And so my, I, I didn't even hear it because um, at the time I'm in college and I started to get into that mode where I was like, oh, I'm too cool to listen to the state radio station. So I, I my dad texted me. He's like, you need to send your demo again. I was like, well, if I sent it already and they don't like me, they're not going to like me now, whatever. But I did. I sent it. And the day I got a call to cut, to come in and do like a, a phone interview or, or no, the day I got a call to go in and do an in-person interview was the day that I got a root canal at the dentist and I couldn't talk as it is, but I had to go in and announce a baseball game. So I'm at the baseball game and I'm like, now batting number 13. And I'm like, there's like, it's feel, it sounds like I have marshmallows in my mouth and it's a hot mess, but I'm, you know, suffering through it. I'm soldiering through next thing I know, it's like seventh inning stretch. And I get this call on my phone and it says Artie Schultz makes 95.1. And I'm like, son of a gun. So I answer it. I'm like, hello. <laughs> and and I finally was like, okay, I got to preface this before you like, you know, this isn't actually my normal voice. I, I got a root canal today and they're like, would you like to come in and get an interview? And so I interviewed and I started doing part time on Saturdays from 10 until two for a little while until it actually started to get kind of busy for me to, to consistently do that every weekend, started alternating for a little while. And then at around like at the end of like 2017 going into 2018, there was the opportunity, uh, there was a full-time position in the sales department that had opened up. And I was like, you know, I already do marketing for like a couple of people on the side just for fun. And I market myself with the DJing business. Oh, what, what, you know, how hard could it be to dive into the sales side of things and didn't want to leave on air obviously. And so I was doing sales from early 2018 on where I was doing 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. and then driving up to Chambersburg and doing my six to 10 air shift and then going home and doing my workouts. And I was like, all right. For the love of radio, This right? is a marathon, yeah. And then finally in like October of 2018 was whenever corporate uh, you know, came to a couple of us and they were like, hey, we're rebranding Wild to Live. We think it's a great you know, kind of uh, innovation and, and we wanna move the station forward. The, you know, the ratings are there. The station was always dominant in Washington County, but the revenue's not there. Let's see if we can kind of you know, change things up a little bit and see what it does. And we wanna have somebody on the station that is boots on the ground there and is representing Hagerstown and we want you to do that. And I was like, sounds great. What does that mean for sales? Cause I know I have to still sell. And they were like, Oh, you're still going to sell. You're still going to do your, your, your daily sales job. Uh, but at two o'clock you'll go in and you'll put together your show. Some days you can record it if you need to, but you'll do it live. And then, and then you go up and you'll do your show for mix. Eventually the mix show dissipated and it was like, all right, we need to get something off of Ryan's <laughs> plate a little bit. Um, and then, so I was just doing live for a little while. And then finally, like the end of 2020, was the point where I was like, all right, my heart's not in it for sales. What can I do here? And I had a couple of conversations with, you know, our higher ups and was just like, I want to go full time on air. I'm already doing a ton of on air content related stuff. I'm doing stuff for all of our stations during the pandemic. I was doing like community interviews that pertain to each you know, geographic part of our stations. Um, I was started doing news because when they did all the layoffs and stuff, they had cut our news director and I got a call from our OM that was like, hey, you have a journalism degree, right? Can you do our morning news? And it's on the interim. It would be very temporary. We'll figure something out in a couple of weeks. And I had done news until like four months ago um, in the mornings. Uh, usually it was the night before I'd record it and, and, and throw it in there. But again, at the end of 2020, I was able to kind of navigate out of sales and, and get back on mix, do some, you know, out of market voice tracking stuff and kind of do the on air side of things full time, which again, my heart was in that, you know, but it was really awesome to learn both sides of the aisle, learn sales, learn how the two kind of bridge together. And it was super, so it was super easy for me to be able to do the act of presenting the benefit of selling or of, of buying radio advertising, the, the benefit of doing endorsements, the benefit of all that kind of stuff. 
it was the can I have your money side of things that it was so hard for me because okay. I, I am notoriously a, a people pleaser kind of personality. And, yep. you know, and so for me, I'd be like, so, hey, this is what it is. It's so awesome. You're going to love it. This is how much it costs. Well, that's too expensive. You're right. Never mind. Goodbye. And I would leave. And, and, I, and my, and my budgets, I that like, it were awful. I'd be like, you know, Ryan, like, you know, I, like, I don't understand. Like, you know, you, you're, you're not like, why are your budgets not looking that great? I was like, cause I could sell, I can sell the crap out of our stations. But when it came down to like the negotiating side of things and working through conflicts and, and, and rejection and all that kind of stuff, I just be like, all right, never mind. I remember the biggest one. I, I so much wanted to have a car dealership as one of my clients because I knew like oh, yeah. those are the ones that make the most money and all of our our other like two salespeople already had like a bunch of the, the car dealerships in the area. And so there was a car dealership that's right down the road from my house that I was like, this is the one. I'm getting this one. I'm you know, I'm gonna work like heck to get them on the air. Um, because they were on the air with our competitors. And I remember like going down there and I learned that like one of my friends from church was a salesperson there. And I, to this day, I still question mark why I did this, but I went down there and I was like, I need an SUV because <laughs> I did. I technically needed a vehicle for stowing equipment and stuff. I had a little car that I was like shoving everything into. And I was like, I do need an SUV. I was in the market for one, but I was like, I'm going to use this to get them on the air. <laughs> and I did. I went and I, I, I had uh, my friend from church uh, sold me an SUV and we were driving around and test driving and I would flip over to mix or live or like one of our stations and you would hear like me voicing a commercial and he was like, oh wow, I didn't know you worked on the air. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, on these stations. And he was like, oh cool, are we on there? No, we're not, you're not on our stations. Um, this is a problem and he'd be like, well, yeah, let me talk to our GM about that. That seems a little bit ridiculous. I'm like, you really should talk to your GM about that. I think it's very important that you're on our radio stations. So, and then, you know, fast forward two weeks, got them on the air. They were one of my clients until the pandemic. Um, and so they they were just like- Oh my God, it's amazing because I've not heard any story like that. And so I'm like, all right, cool. I got this car dealership on the air. Um, I'm, you know, in debt for a couple more years, but hey, I got a car dealership on the air um, for at least eight months until they ran out of, you know, money and couldn't spend our, you know, their budget on us. But it is what it is. Um, but yeah, I, I learned is, a lot about it. you made a goal it. and you did it. I did. I achieved it and I felt good about it. Um, and, and now, you know, I still go down there and get my oil changes and all that stuff. And it reminds me of the time that I had basically like sold myself and my credit score to get a, uh, get a client on the air we could do a whole entire podcast episode about the gentlemen's clubs in our Eastern Panhandle of <laughs> West Virginia that, uh, you know, had me, I, I sold their, their, you know, obviously sold to them as a client. Um, but they would always have me voice the stations. And of course, you know, I'm a leader in my church, uh, you know, involved oh, in ministry. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know. It's kind of uneasy. So my, my trade off was, okay, I'll do it. Because again, as a salesperson, they're, you know, a client of mine and they were paying a good amount of money. Um, and I just was like, you know what? Yeah, I'm gonna be a little bit, a little slimier. Um, but I changed my voice, not like not using a voice changer, but just naturally I'd be like, and now over at the Gentleman's Club coming up next Saturday, it's white wet t-shirt night and KY Jelly Wrestling featuring such and such WWF wrestler from the 80s that everyone forgot about. Sunday night at 2 a.m. And like, but everyone that knew me knew it was me. And so they'd hear it and they're like, what the heck was that? I had a pastor at the church I was at at the time was like, hey man, listen to your station. I'm like, you really shouldn't because you're going to hear a commercial here in a minute about like girls rolling around in peanut butter. God knows what they were wrestling with at that weekend. They tried to get me to MC stuff there. It was it was just nuts. The, the and, and the day that I got them as a client, they had me meet at the club. Now it was an hour before opening. So it's like, I'll get, you know, in and out. I'll be able to like get them, you know, get the signature and all that. Well, at the time they were trying to get the, uh, they were trying to book the Ying Yang twins for a concert. And so the owner would come to me, sit down and talk to me. And then the owner would walk away and go downstairs to like work on getting the Ying Yang twins booked. They opened at 3 PM by like 2:50. I'm starting to panic. Cause I'm like, I'm sitting literally at a table next to the stage 
And, and, you know, they're still trying to work out the yin yang twins situation. And so finally he comes up and he's talking to me and he's like, all right, I got to take this call real quick. And I'm like, all right, I'm just going to be in here at opening time, but it's three o'clock. There's no way that there's activity at three o'clock. I was freaking wrong. I'm sitting alone at a table with a folder and a laptop looking like I'm sitting inside of a Starbucks. And next thing you know, door opens, metal detectors out, bunch of dudes are rolling through. It's three o'clock and I start hearing, I don't know what her name was, but the, on the, over the microphone and now ladies and gentlemen, here comes Stacy Sparkles or whatever. <laughs> and there is a woman not wearing clothing, literally like, right here and I'm like sitting here typing away on my computer acting like nothing is happening next to me and and there is just this whole entire show going on right next door and I will never forget it because they did not sign at that meeting I they left didn't. without a signature my boss calls me and he's like hey man how'd it go you you've been out for a while and I was like well um I, I, I witnessed a lot and I went through a lot, but I don't have a signature. And there, he was like, you didn't, you, you should have told them you weren't leaving without a signature. I was like, I was not camping out any longer than I was there because I didn't know what was going to occur if that was three o'clock in the afternoon. So they did like a couple hours later, they sent me like a scan, like on their Gmail that was like, Hey, yeah, we're agreeing it. And, and I worked with them for like seven or eight months. The guy that I worked with was not like heavily involved with the actual actual location. So it was nice that I wasn't like working with that same guy that I sat down with for three hours. Cause he walked back to the table and was like, Oh, you're getting yourself a free show. And I was like, I didn't sign up for it. Um, uh, I was like, you're like, your Lord only forgives up to five o'clock. Hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's like, I would be like, so let's talk about this. Uh, I'd be like, let's talk about this contract I'd be like, Oh, let's talk about the girl up on the stage. It was whoo. Those were the adventures of working in sales while also working on air was there were some times where I was faced with the opportunity to sell myself and I did not. You actually do content for church like now too. So like when did that actually like intersect? Yeah, that was a COVID time thing. Like July of 2020, um, I had gotten called in. They were like, hey, you know, obviously we know you, you know, you work in broadcast, we work in radio. Um, we would love for you to to do our online church hosting stuff. We have a team and they were just literally starting to build it because they had no choice at the time. Obviously, their you know, churches were closed and you know, uh, social distancing was a whole thing. And so we've continued to do it to present day. But it's cool because like for me, I compare our industry so much to church a lot because like at the end of the day, the whole idea of a church or, you know, zoomed out beyond the spiritual side of things, the whole idea of a church is you have your congregation and you want to retain your congregation. And so you do things to retain your congregation, but you also have to bring in a lot of people into your congregation so that when those other people might leave or go to another church or may, you know, pass away or whatever that you have, you know, you're continuing to grow. And looking at that from the radio side of things, it's, it's the, it's an exact replica of what radio and broadcast is now in this That's day and age, point. Yeah. because at the end of the day, you look at the, like the, the, you know, with radio, you're a radio station, say you're a heritage station that's been around for 40 to 50 years. You can take one of two routes. You could take the route of like, oh, well, you know, we're just going to keep doing the same thing that we've been doing for 50 years. Or you can go the, we're a church route, which is let's maintain those listeners that have been listening for, you know, Lord knows how long, um, but also do outreach in the community, which is how you bring in and grow a congregation as a church and a church brand is to do stuff that, that people see that they're like, oh, wow, what, are, you know, what are they doing over there? And and so when we launched this, when we launched 96.7, um, they, you know, they came to us and they were like, we want you to be a Hagerstown station. We want you to be the hub cities station. And before we had, you know, rebranded, the station was just music and sweepers 24 seven. And, and it worked ratings wise. They were, you know, we were number one in Washington County for ages because it was just like, that was the station that everybody was into. And but, but I was like, all right, if we're going to be branded as like the hub cities live 96, seven, we need to be out in the community and myself and our PD for that station are both people that are our leaders and communicators in our own respective churches. And we went the route of like, well, look, like, let's treat this like it's a church. You know, obviously we're not like 
jumping in there and doing Bible study at, at three o'clock in the afternoon, but we yeah. are, you know, we're, we're, we're doing stuff like going out and doing community events that we know that like, okay, yeah, we're probably not going to get paid a dime for any of this stuff, but it's, you know, it, it's stuff that's happening in the city of Hagerstown. It's stuff that's happening, you know, in Washington County. Let's go set up a tent there if they allow us and let's go, you know, do some videos there. You know, let's, let's do this kind of stuff because then at the end of the day, they see our new brand. They see our brand. They, you know, there's people that still call us wild and that's perfectly fine. Um, it keeps, it keeps the competitors from stealing the name, um, and doing it themselves. But at the, at the end of the day, like, you know, it, it, people go out there and they're like, oh, wow. Like, you know, it's a radio station that's, that's doing stuff and it keeps radio relevant too. At the end of the day, like I've had conversations with colleagues about this, where it's like, my goodness, if you're not going out there and doing outreach as your radio brand, you might as well quit. Like you might as well retire. You might as well go to a new field because at the end of the day, if you're not going out there and doing stuff for the people in some way, shape or form, then, you know, you might as well just not exist. Like, and, and that's helped us now in, you know, fast forward to like, you know, we've had current events happen in our area. Like we had a shooting, uh, mass shooting happen in Smithsburg, which is just outside of Hagerstown a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, we had the option, okay, the next afternoon when I go on the air, am I going to talk about, you know, what Kim Kardashian's doing, or am I going to, you know, talk about what's going on in Smithsburg? And I remember the night before I went on the air that or the night that all of that happened, I had, you know, just went up on Facebook and I said, look, you know, either I'm not going on the air at all tomorrow afternoon, or I'm going on the air and we're talking about this as a community and we're just going to mourn together. And it, I had people messaging, you know, right away that were telling stories about the victims because again, you know, it's a very small community. Everybody knows everybody. So people were sending in stories about their brother that had just gotten shot and killed, uh, their, their husbands, their, their aunts, their cousins. And I mean, it was, inc- it was insanely heavy, but it was such a testament going, coming away from that, knowing that like, look, we're a station for the community and, and there's that family bond that was kind of put together. And again, it all comes back to the idea, the concept of a church of you want to grow your congregation. Yeah. You want to grow your congregation. And so that's helped then whenever I'm hosting church, because then I also look at online church as a radio brand, as a TV brand, because you never want to go on the air online whenever I'm doing like online church and just start spewing out scripture and, and speaking like the pastor speaks when he's doing a sermon. I go on there and the same way that I talk on the air on the stations is the same way that I talk whenever I'm in front of the camera doing online church, because I know that like, okay, if I can make those people feel comfortable by doing it, by communicating in that way, then there's been a lot of people that have come through the doors of the church and they've told us that like, we felt like we've been here for two years, even though we've never stepped foot in the building because we felt comfortable. Cause I mean, you go to a new church or you haven't gone to church for a while and you go into a church, you have the heebie jeebies. It's intimidating. Yeah. Yeah. You walk in and you're like, all right, where's the lightning bolt? Or like, you know, who do I talk to? How does this work? You know, why am I getting this coffee cup all of a sudden? Like there's all of those things. And so, you know, I just kind of run with like the idea of like, okay, what can I do to make sure that like this person feels comfortable and feels at ease and also feels at home. And then that has, that has blessed me so much with doing stuff in radio. Cause then I've taken so much from online church and put it into, into what I do on the air. And then I've done the same thing that I put so much that I do on the air and put it into the, you know, the church broadcast side of things, which makes it less of like a, you know, Joel Osteen production and more of like a, you know, a genuine, like, Hey, this is me. This is the real Ryan. And let me talk to you like a regular human being kind of thing. Uh, it's, and literally, I have been on your live before. Like, there was one time I was literally on Facebook and I signed in and I was like, I didn't know what you were doing. Like, I thought yeah. you were like at a radio event, like a, like a, it looked like before a concert started right. or something like that and a broadcast. And you guys were doing something interact, like an actual game or yeah. something like that. I, yeah. I want to say maybe it was around Easter. So maybe uh-huh. it had to do with eggs or I don't yeah. know. But I was like, it took me a second to even realize that it was a church broadcast. I was like, what is Ryan doing? I was like, and I was like, and I thought, I was like, this is a really uh, intense radio station. Like it looked nice, like the camera yeah. and everything. And then I was like, oh, this is a church feed. I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. And like, again, it's funny that you say that the church was even reaching out being like, hey, let's do these things. We want to reach our community. And again, I love that comparison with like the congregation and everything. 
because it just makes me go, okay, the churches were realizing what we're doing in the pandemic. Yeah. How can we still reach our audience? Where the radio station still wants to fight it sometimes. Yeah, because then it was like even as a church brand, we had the we had two options. We could just like flip a switch and hit go and just live stream the service, or we could actually like promote it like it's a broadcast entity and do stuff like games. Like there was one time that. I like I was challenged to eat like an entire funnel cake it, while the other person hosted the pre-show. So there were like the things like that that were like, you know what? Like this is funny. People are entertained by it. And, and like I've used some clips from online church, like in my hosting, my online, my like video reel, like for, to send out to like potential employers and stuff like that. Because honestly, like, you know, there are parts of it that I'm like, no, this is so much fun and it's going to look fun on a reel. Like there was, uh, what was it last summer? Yeah. Last summer we were outside hosting one time and a cicada flew right into my face and I like had to pick it up and flick it away in the middle of the show. And it was just like <laughs> moments like that. Like, again, it, 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 it really, it humanizes the personality and I've tried to kind of incorporate that with what I do on air in radio, whenever I'm hosting events out live or on, you know, on streaming so that people know that like, oh, okay, this is Ryan. Cause I've had like my, uh, you know, our program director for live at his church, he's had people come up to him and they're like, all right. So that like Ryan's Metzer, are like, he's a, he's a jerk, right? Like he's an a-hole. Like he's, he's kind of a, like he's got behind the scenes. He's like the worst, right? That's gotta be the, like, and, and, and Mike's like, no, no, he's, He's exactly like what you see online. Like he's, he's fun and he's, he's nice and he's not a jerk. And I'm like, well, thank goodness that's the case. Like, you know, cause th there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of jerks in a lot of different industries, but there are a lot of jerks in this industry and you kind of have to work to either a navigate it and be, you know, be the better person and, and, you know, try to like establish, you know, less jerks moving forward. We're starting to learn, like we talked about earlier, that it's not us against each other anymore. It's us against everybody else. So like, we all have to be friends and the internet forced us to do that. Even whenever I first like came into the industry and I would get like slapped on the hand for like being friends or interacting with like people on the competitor, like in the competing stations, I'd be like, hold on, like, we're all we're, we're all doing this for the good of the industry and if we're rooting for each other to fail then we might as well just shut down radio like tear down the towers make them usable for something else like screw it because at the end of the day like if we're if we're out for each other's heads then forget it like I never want to be I never want to work in an industry where we're like hey yeah really like you really love your stuff but like you're dead to me. <laughs> like, it's just not my thing. Um, and so like, I remember the first couple of years that I was working in radio in this market, like one of our top stations in the area is a country station. And it's literally like five minutes down the road from my house and two of the personalities go to my gym. So like I started just generating a rapport with them. And finally, like one of them was like, thank you by the way, for just like having a conversation because they're like in the past, we've had people on competing stations that will like, like you practically spit in our faces when they walk by us at the grocery store um, because they're like, you know, well, that person beat me in the ratings this month or I want to make sure that I beat them in the ratings and their station has to rebrand or their station, you know, they have to fire their staff and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, uh, like we're, right. we're, we're already faced with a time where like, you know, there's massive corporate layoffs and all of these things are happening where people are falling victim to just the way that things are going. And, you know, so for me to like root for someone else's failure or root for like someone else to get like better or worse ratings, like the, the one thing that we did whenever we like relaunched as live was like, I basically told like my PD, I was like, unless it's like, we're explosively amazing or it's a giant red flag. I don't want to go in and dig into like every possible rating scenario and start to create a story of why the ratings book was good and blah, 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 blah. I was like, unless you're firing me, I just want to know how the revenue is because again, I was in sales at that time. So I was like, I want to know if my station's making the most money and we have the smallest, <laughs> We have the smallest stick of the four stations that we have in our cluster. And like within the last like two years, like we've consistently been like 140% of, of like, of like our like monthly budget. And again, it's a tiny station, but we've just kind of just tried to, you know, utilize that, that again, that love for the community and kind of bridging people together. And then eventually it pays the bills. Like that's, you know, putting community first and then watching the rest of it kind of grow organically, you know, has been kind of nice to see. And, and it all is because we're not, you know, 
going to the station across the street and telling them to pound sand. Like that's just not the case. And then like you see like, you know, even online, like obviously like, you know, Kyler Ray and Anthony aren't like on Twitch, like trashing other Twitch streamers. <laughs> like, no, um, if anything, they're raising up that community. And then see, you're seeing that like bridging of that community with, with the radio community, even through stuff like through like free for all. Um, like there's these two communities that mash into one and thank God for that, because at some point down the road, that's probably where radio shows are going to live. So <laughs> like, you know, the, the inevitable is that a lot of it is going to be streaming based or online based. And so, you know, we might as well invest into that community as much as possible and introduce them to our world because at some point those two worlds are probably going to collide. Honestly, like if it weren't for COVID, so many people wouldn't be like empowered to do podcasting. So many people wouldn't be empowered to do stuff like Twitter spaces and stuff like streaming and and really just content creation. It, it's opened up a world for like everybody to be able to be a part of that in some way, shape or form, which again motivates us as radio personalities to be like, Hey, you know, poop or get off the pot in the, you know, in this kind of world. Um, you know, I'm, the one person within our, our cluster that does, you know, the live streaming and stuff. And I continuously pour in to be like, Hey, we got to start like really ramping this up to be a part of sales packages, be a part of, you know, all these different things. Um, because again, it's just like, that's what's added to like a normal spot schedule that like really sweetens the deal. Things, you know, I love that you were kind of doing the research on like Seacrest and all that, like how can they, you know, doing radio and just really, I guess, putting yourself everywhere. So like, going forward, are you just kind of just whatever, as long as you get to entertain and do that? Or is there like a specific goal to be on TV or just as long as you're in front of an audience, you don't really care how it is. The, the Seacrest goal has, has stuck around. It's evolved a lot over the years. Um, but like I have told, I have told potential employers in interviews before that, like, I want to be the next Ryan Seacrest. And now I'm like, okay, I need to kind of reframe that a little bit. Cause it sounds like I'm 10, which it was a dream when I was 10, but you know, I do want to kind of carry on that pathway to where, you know, what, what Seacrest is doing is very similar to what a lot of us are doing. He just gets paid a lot more money um, is, you know, is literally finding ways to, to create and produce content in as many avenues as possible and, you know, and, and create that personal brand, but for, you know, for good causes, for good reasons and, and, and things like that and, and to promote positivity and whatnot. And so for me, like, Yes, I want to be the next Ryan Seacrest, but I also want to be the best Ryan Smetzer that I can be and and grow that to, you know, whatever avenue I can grow it to, um, but also be able to, you know, widen it to wherever. Um, so not making it just, you know, just Hagerstown, but being able to branch out and be able to be on the air in whatever capacity, whether it's radio, TV, whatever, in D.C., in Baltimore, New York, Philly, you know, Florida or whatever it might be, um, be able to kind of stretch out to those areas as well. Um, and so that's kind of, that's kind of where I'm at as far as like the, where I want to be in five to 10 years kind of thing. Yeah. That which is a hard like, question. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a really hard question. Cause you never know really what the industry is going to look like in five to 10 years. And so that's why I tell people all the time, like, you know, my goal used to be like, oh yeah, I want to be able to grow to major market radio. It still remains that, but I always say like, I want to be able to grow to major market radio or whatever that looks like in 10 years, <laughs> because it could be completely different, but I want to be wherever that is. And I, and not for the sole purpose of like getting to the top of the mountain and pumping my fist because it doesn't get any easier and it doesn't get any, you know, less intense and crazy and back and forth, you know, having friends that have either been in major market or are currently in major market, you know, they'll tell you, they're like, yeah, no, it's, you know, you don't get to like a big market and be like, all right, we did it. I'm retired now. Like, no, it's like, it gets, it gets a lot tougher and it gets a lot more crazy and you have to navigate even more obstacles of, you know, of communities that are larger and stuff like that. And so, you know, I know that there's, there's a lot to it, but I do want to be able to kind of, you know, navigate that a little bit and see, just see where this, this roller coaster ride takes me. Cause there have been so many random like things and projects that I've done that I'm like, this is why I do what I do. And like some of them are normal. Some of them are outrageously abnormal. I, I hosted a live streamed uh, international arm wrestling tournament during COVID and thought to myself, I don't know where this career is taking me, but this is kind of neat. It's a little weird, but it's hilarious. Um, and it, and it's great on my reel now. Um, cause I can like, you know, I was, I co-hosted with a guy that is like the international champion of arm wrestling and, and he had a voice like this. And it was just like, 
it was the wildest thing in the world. No one told him that this was, it was streaming on like a family Facebook page that was not, you know, profanity. Like we didn't have like a, you know, a dump button. Luckily it wasn't on the radio or anything like that. And there wasn't anything FCC involved, but like I'd go on and be like, all right. And you know, we're, we're back here at the uh, international arm wrestling champions championships back to our co-hosts. And he'd be like, what the beep is up? Beep, beep, beep. This is some good bleep. Oh, it was, it was unbelievable, but it was, again, it was so much fun. Um, and so just like, again, taking advantage of any opportunity I have, that was a perfect example where it was like coming out of COVID. I was literally in quarantine with the coronavirus. And uh, like somebody called me, and was like, hey, um, can you host an event on Saturday? So literally the day after I was out of quarantine, I like went and did this like live streamed arm wrestling tournament. Didn't know anything about arm wrestling except for what you learn about in grade school when you just grab the hand and pull. Um, but they, they had like grips and weird equipment and all this kind of stuff. And yeah, so weird stuff like that is what reminds me of like, OK, this this industry is not strictly just I'm going to sit here in front of a microphone and say the forecast every hour. It's you might, you know, interview some arm wrestlers every now and again. You were one of the other radio people that purchased Carla Marie and Anthony's like gear, you know, because yeah. it was like one thing of like their close like buddies that worked with them on Elvis, like with Elvis Duran and stuff. But like to see you do that, I was like, oh, that's like super cool. You know what I mean? It's such like a cool brand. But then like I see you like supporting like everybody else. And I just love it because it's like all about like the radio <laughs> fam. And I like I love when I see you like writing like, DJ Hi Kevin's like stuff or like even yeah, yeah, Kira yeah. stuff. I'm like, you are like the best like cheerleader of everybody's personal brand. So I think that's freaking awesome. We all have our own like, you know, personal brands and, and podcasts and shows and stuff that we have going on. And for me, I'm like, okay, if, you know, if I'm going to run out to like H and M and get like three, like pointless shirts that are going to like wear off and die in, in two months or get a jacket that I know is going to like, you know, go and support somebody that's like doing their own thing at the same time. It's awesome. Plus like, again, I'm a fan before I'm an employee in the radio industry. And so, you know, that's like, you know, being able to support like Kira's podcast, being able to support like Carla Marie and Anthony's like, you know, shows and programming and their like merch line and then seeing cool stories. Like, I don't know if you saw where uh, when I was at uh, Chicago Midway Airport, um, I was on a trip last week and there was uh, I think I like posted a picture of me in the jacket on my story and, and both of them, Carla Marie and Anthony put it up on their, on their story. Somebody actually swiped up and said that like, Hey, I was also at Chicago midway and I walked by that guy and I saw his jacket and I went to say something, but my husband was like, no, that might be kind of weird. Um, and I thought it was so cool that he had the jacket. And so and I was like, that is so cool. And now like me and that, that person that found that saw the jacket, we follow each other on Instagram. So it's just like, it's a community. <laughs> I literally have goosebumps with you telling yeah. me that. And I've been waiting for my, you look great moment for with a stranger. <laughs> Well, that's that a, so she, great. like Carla Marie was like, oh, you should have like said to him, like, you look great. And like, you know, like build that. And then the woman was like, oh, yeah, I was just like kind of nervous, but I didn't want to say anything or whatever. And uh, but it's just such a cool moment to see that, like, oh, it's a small world, because, again, it really is. Uh